Hi, I'm Morten Solvik, Vice President of Model Foundation and host and producer of the Model Hour, where we bring you the personalities, places, and projects happening right now in the model community around the world. Welcome. Last month, we brought you four perspectives on Mahler's Second Symphony, a podcast, a piano transcription, a listening guide, and a filmic interpretation of the work. My guests were Marilyn McCoy, Jason Starr, and Alexander Vivero. Remember, you can see this show and all past Mahler Hours on our website. During this episode of the Mahler Hour, we will be exploring the life and works of a central person in the great composer's life, Natalie Bauer-Lechner. She was a remarkable woman, an accomplished musician, an intellectual, an author, a pacifist, an advocate of women's rights. She was also for 10 years Mahler's confidant and amanuensis of sorts. Today, we will take a closer look at Natalie Bauer-Lechner with a tribute to her accomplishments. Before we begin, let me remind everyone attending live to post any questions you might have for our guests to the comments section. We will get to these at the end of our show. Don't forget to include your name and at least the city and country you are writing from. Also, the Mahler Hour is brought to you by Mahler Foundation. So if you want to support our activities, please become a member. Just go to our website at mahlerfoundation.org for all of the details. My first guest today is Sibylla Verna conductor, musicologist, and biographer. Perhaps best well known to the model community in her work completing, revising, and editing the first volume of Henri-Louis de Lagrange's massive four books dedicated to the life and works of Gustav Mahler. Welcome, Sibylle. Thank you. Welcome, Morten. Glad to be here. You appeared on our very first Mahler Hour nearly two years ago when volume one was first published. And throughout this book, we find mention of Natalie Bauer-Lechner, our main character today. So who was Natalie Bauer-Lechner? Um, Natalie Bauer-Lechner was born in Vienna. She was two years older than Mahler, was born in 1858. She was the oldest of five children, four boys, four girls and a boy. Her father owned a bookshop and was a publisher. Her mother was the daughter of a legal scholar. So she grew up in a very intellectual bourgeois household. She was homeschooled, so she never went to school. She had private tutors and later complained that she didn't get the same education as her brother. But also there was a lot of music in her house. Her parents made music almost every day. Her father played the piano, the mother sang. So at the age of eight, she was enrolled at the Vienna Conservatory together with her sister Ellen to study violin. And at the age of 11, she added accompanying piano she graduated at the early age of 14 with a second prize. How, can I ask how, how common, I mean, it sounds astounding. I mean, at that point, it sounds like a music school, not necessarily a conservatory, someone at that age. Was this common to be let in at that, at that age? There were different levels of admission. Mm. Um, there was the preschool, there was the main school. Um, I assume she went through the process of going to the Vorschule and then the Hauptschule, but she did, as it was mentioned in the Neue Freie Presse in 1872, she did graduate with a diploma and a second prize. So I assume at that point that was the main conservatory. When right. we look at Mahler, I mean, he had also contemporaries, fellow students who were 14 or something like that, but this was really very early. Yeah, Mahler was 15 when he came, obviously. And he so entered. Yes, and she was 14 right. when she finished. When she finished. So it's, it's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. Um, she kept playing in the orchestra as an, as an extra afterwards in the conservatory orchestra, which actually where she first encountered Mahler when he was thrown off the podium by Helmes Berger because his composition, some symphony, which I don't quite believe, maybe a movement that was full of mistakes. And she already felt sorry for this poor boy who had some um, talent, but wasn't recognized. Yeah. But then comes a strange period in her life that's hardly ever talked about. She got married at the age of 17 to a man who was 22 years her senior, was a professor of, of chemistry at the Technical University. Yeah. And he was a widower with three daughters from 12 to one at the time of their marriage. Um, one wonders why the parents consented to it. And Knut Martner, the Danish scholar, even has a theory that maybe the youngest child was Natalie's because it was baptized uh, in the Protestant faith while the father was Catholic. And Martina claims, I've never seen the pictures, that she looked a lot 
like Natalie and not so much like the two older sisters. So that might have been one reason, but be that as it may. So for 10 years, she led the life of a Frau professor in Vienna until the marriage got dissolved in 1885, as they say, by mutual agreement. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what she did the next five years. Nobody knows where she is. She doesn't appear in any kind of musical context in Vienna. And um, in 1990, we actually then have the first contact with Mahler. 1890. Now, yeah. What we really know about her professional life that she played for practically 20 years in the Soldat Riga string quartet as a violist. And it was um, a very high level quartet. You know, the press uh, marveled that four women could play as well as an all male quartet. And they toured extensively throughout Germany, throughout Austria and abroad. Um, so that lasted until about 1913, 14. Afterwards, she had to support herself by giving violin lessons, by playing the viola. Um, and she also, while she was still active as a musician, she had written this pamphlet, uh, Fragmente, Geliebtes und Gelerntes. It's a collection of essays about all kinds of themes, philosophical, uh, psychological, sociological. It's about 230 pages. Mm -hmm. And it has a strong feminist viewpoint and a socialist viewpoint. So she also, of course, was for women's suffrage and you know, women should have a much more active life, a line in, in life. Mm -hmm. She also wrote in 1918, a pamphlet against the war, which landed her in jail, as a matter of fact, accused of high treason. And afterwards, um, it seems that her health was really bad, that she had aged prematurely um, that she was somewhat infirm. She spent some time in an, um, what do you call it, a sanatorium. Mm -hmm. In the last few months of her life, she spent at her brother's Oscar's house, where she died in 1921, of what they say, old age and melancholia. Mm -hmm. And she was only 63 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's ended very sadly for her, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, she uh, was friends with um, a, quite a group of people. I mean, Mahler was certainly today the most prominent, but she was also uh, close friends with Siegfried Lippner uh, exactly. and, and the intellectual circles around um, Mahler's inner circle. She was in the middle of all of that in, in a crucial time during his life uh, for those 10 years. Um, so but we have we have a we have a we know a lot about her she was you know very accomplished in her own right but it, it was her habit of writing a diary and keeping an intense uh, uh um journal of her interactions with Mahler that have turned out to be important at least to posterity up till now um so how did her relationship um developed during that time. You said they met at the conservatory. She was no longer a student there, but she, as no, you said, she, she was an extra in their orchestra. She sort of must have hung out there to, to, to spend time with her, her, um, her like-minded uh, friends. Uh, but what was the nature of her relationship with Mahler? Well, they really were living in the, uh, were moving in the same circles. You mentioned Lipina. I mean, there's also a book that she wrote about conversations with Lipina, which no longer exists. And he next to Mahler was her great inspiration as somebody that she was so thankful of having met in her life. And through this kind of with Lipina, they met at the house of Pichler, who was a fellow student of Mahler, Kralik, where she first heard him play the piano and was so impressed. And then in 1889, she was at the house of Fleur, who was a good friend of Mahler, together with Justine. And Mahler invited this group to come and visit him, which she did in 1890. And this is really where her association with Mahler starts. When she met him in Budapest, stayed there for a few weeks. Um, that's when they really, after having crossed ways so many times, started to become friends. But the, the most important part of their life together started actually in 1893, when she started being almost a part of the family, started spending vacations with Mahler and his family in Steinbach mm -hmm. and started writing down all these 70s, 
sayings, all, all these conversations. What well, are not really conversations? I mean, when you read it, she must have had an incredible memory because she claims that she usually wrote down the things a few hours after they happened. But we have extensive quotes by Mahler of a very high linguistic level where he talks about all kinds of philosophical subjects, musical subjects that she claims to practically have written down verbatim some hours later, which I think is a great accomplishment. But it's to our advantage that we have her impressions of what Mala said. I don't know that it's 100% accurate, but I'm sure she spent every effort to make it as accurate as possible. We're going to look at more carefully at how she spent that extra effort in a, in a little bit. Um, but as in, in writing these down, you also intimate, and this, this is clear from looking at other independent sources, sometimes that Mahler may have written to another friend that Natalie didn't know about, or there might've been an incident that's recorded, that really is truly reflected in what Natalie writes. So there seems to be very little artistic license in what she's invested here. Um, why do you think she was so intent on getting this, getting this right? Why? I mean, she, Mahler spent time with a lot of people, including, of course, his wife, and no one, no one did the kind of diligence to what Mahler said uh, as, as Natalie did those, during those 10 years. Well, Natalie was a kind of Eckermann for him. I mean, she really, he impressed her so much. And as a musician, she was really also very much interested in his thinking as a musician and in his creative process. We have a lot of sources like Ferdinand Fohl or um, Alma, of course, who doctored some of her things, I would think, and was not as interested in, in, in these kind of details. But for her, it was so important to understand Mahler as a musician, as a composer, as a philosopher. I mean, he talked to her about everything, starting from what he thought about other composers to his life, his early life, his family. But the, for me, what's really so striking and so important about her diary entries is this glimpse of his creative process. Mm -hmm. We don't have that from anybody else. I mean, it's not just that he came yesterday and said he needed a second theme. No, you really get the sense of that Mahler felt himself almost possessed. Is that, you know, you don't compose, you get composed. And this whole process of things that kind of came to him, things that he had to struggle with, you know, at one point she writes about, you know, that he told her about a dream that Beethoven or Wagner, he didn't know which one came to him, said, well, to solve your problem here, bring the horns in three measures later. Mm -hmm. uh, and this whole creative process of Mahler's that's so different from other composers. She never writes about uh, concrete technical things. It's like, uh, if I had known how this first movement of the first of the third symphony would develop, I would never have started it. If I hadn't written the other movements before, or the fourth, I was going to write a humoresque to turn into a symphony. It's like almost it was out of his control what happened. And always the sense of purpose. It's not that he wants to have a technical solution to something. No, he wants to accomplish something. He wants to go somewhere. It has to have content. It's a struggle of this against that. He finds himself thrown about by the universe. He finds himself being like a Christ on the Mount of Olives. He's suffering. He is struggling. I mean, this whole process we don't find reflected in any of the other writings. A little bit about his own letters but not to this extent that Natalie was really there and saw what a heavy birth it was for him to write these symphonies, especially the second, especially the third, second and third, a little bit of fourth, but this is okay. you know, an incredible glimpse into his creative process. Yeah, and which, in, which speaks to the just uh, uh, unique, unique uh, trust he had in her. I mean, you know, in, it's in, in fact, it's quite maddening when you do read his letters to see when he starts to sort of go to the precipice where he starts to describe the process or he starts to explain something creatively. He will almost always write, but more later. We'll talk about that when I see you in Berlin. Or, I mean, it's almost always cut short as, as if Mahler is editing himself when it comes to his letters. And yet with Natalie, I suppose because it's not in his hand, because he's not directing all of this, that he must have felt uh, very free to do this. It makes you wonder if she was unique in that capacity. First of all, she was a musician, which is our profound luck. She exactly. understood what he was saying. She what he was saying, but did he talk that way to his other musician friends? Did he talk that way? He certainly talked about philosophy with Lipner, 
but she may have been unique in, uh, in even in the type of friendship that they had, which of course we're very, very happy, uh, lucky to well, have. What's interesting is at the time that he wrote the third, he also wrote a lot of letters to Mildenburg, who he was involved yeah. with at that time, but right. they're more, you know, quotidian things and about her and how she is and uh, explaining himself, oh, I haven't written because I'm really in the middle of something here. And then at the same time, he talks to Natalie about his struggles that, you know, I would also think in a letter, you don't really go to these extreme lengths of thing. And with her, they had lengthy conversations. And what she writes is probably the gist of it, the concentrate of what he was talking about. Yeah. And, you know, we can only say we're very lucky to have that. Absolutely. So uh, you especially being lucky, you and Henri-Louis de Lagrange in putting together, of course, the biography. Um, there are so many, so many wonderful uh, broad sweeping statements, also tidbits and morsels and historical facts that pop up. Uh, what kind of role does she play, especially in volume one? Well, she's one of the main sources about his, his life. I said, there are others, like I mentioned, four letters, uh, yeah. Carpat, uh, about his early life, there's some people, but they also, most of them wrote it down much later. It wasn't a contemporary report of what Mala was like. And we have one report of somebody in 1907, you know, describing how he first met Mahler in Bad Hall when he was like a young student coming out of a Catholic boarding school. You know, so now this shyness has left our director of the opera house. But most of these things were written down later. And as we know, if you write it down later, it's not always accurate. It has been embellished. You see it through the lens of 20, 30 years later. But, right. you know, for Natalie to be that close and to be a little bit more reliable than Alma, because those two you know, are the closest sources we have to Mahler, Natalie and Alma. Uh, but no. um, as you said, Natalie is, is corroborated in many other sources. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting is the letters that Justine wrote to Ernestine Lure. That's another contemporary report. But right. um, Natalie was indispensable in, in volume one to get real details about his life. Yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the difference, the distinctions in relationship and the type of relationship uh, with Alma and Natalie. That, of course, uh, plays into this in, a, in an absolutely vital way as well. But I want to thank you so much for contributing uh, to the Mahler Hour today. I know this is just one small corner of this entire story, but it's been very, it's been very nice having you on our show, Sabrina. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for inviting me. All right, so let's take a closer look at these diaries, as I promised just a few minutes ago, and, and um, we'll look at how Natalie prepared these for publication, because as much as she was writing this during the, the time of her interactions with Mahler, um, there was a process behind all of this. And uh, for that, I want to invite Stephen Heffling, musicologist, uh, professor emeritus, author, and editor of a number of Mahler's works, including most recently the award-winning edition of Titan. Welcome back to the show, Stephen. Thank you, Morton. We have uh, just heard from uh, Sibylle Werner how important Natalie Bauer-Lechner is to the process of writing uh, Mahler's biography. Um, for many years, the main sources of these texts, uh, published sources, has been Bauer-Lechner's posthumous Erinnerungen of 1923. I think we have the, the book covers here. Um, this was the originally published in 1923, two years after uh, Natalie uh, passed away. So uh, she didn't live to see the publication of this and that might not have been accidental. We might get to that as well. Um, a later translation into English of that volume and a somewhat expanded version published in 1984 by a relative of Natalie's, uh, Hebert Kilian. So these are the three sort of published sources that most Mahler uh, aficionados are familiar with. Uh, but that's not all we have, is it? No, it certainly isn't. And uh, the remainder of what we have is dispersed in a number of different uh, sources. Some of them, the diaries themselves that Natalie had copied for her use and that she edited, and we'll look at a couple of pages of those. And uh, also some very interesting typescripts, one of which was made very near the end of her life. And uh, she made some late entries uh, into that. So this looks to be uh, something that started as a diary, was then extracted into a more concise, uh, Mahler-oriented um, 
um, maybe not a monograph, but a very, very specific, maybe ex extracts from the diary that then were edited and re-edited for the purposes of publication. So it, what we're reading today in those publications is, is really the long hand of Natalie over some time in going back, filling out, maybe correcting some of the flow of the, of the language of what's happening here. But I think what's important also to keep in mind is that we only really have a portion of, uh, of what was created. We, you and That's I have right. estimated there were about 4,000 copy, uh, paid, copied pages anyway, uh, dedicated to, to Maul. That's, that's the estimate. Um, yes. We're only about um, 1,100 survived. So we're, we're talking about 30% of what was created or was written. And there are different reasons for us surmising this, this total. What happened to the, you know, the rest of, 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 this, of this collection of the 2,000 some pages that are gone? Well, we don't really know. Um, again, the two German editions are both uh, have been tampered with to a fairly notable extent. And um, the original diaries themselves, or rather the copies that Natalie had made, um, probably about 50% of them need to be published before we have the whole account. Again, because the previous editors just didn't either think that all of this material was so important for the general public to have, or they found it potentially offensive to contemporaries, that sort of thing. There are some letters uh, from Mahler's inner circle when word gets out from Natalie that she's thinking of publishing her recollections of Mahler. Yes. Many of these people, almost all of them were still alive in the 19 teens when she was uh, sounding out this idea, including Justina and Alma. And uh, they were, um, I, I wouldn't say panic stricken, but they were, they were uh, vehemently against even the notion of doing this. She must have come under a lot of pressure not to, not to take that final step. Yes, Fritz Lur apparently claimed he was willing to commit a crime to prevent it. <laughs> <laughs> so and at one point she got ticked off and was threatening to burn the diaries, uh, which fortunately didn't happen. But. Right. Um, I had the chance also to speak to Heba Kilian, who was the editor of the 1984 edition, who was a member of that family. Um, uh, and he told me that there were, in fact, it was with Thomas Hampson, the, the three of us were having um, a lunch. And uh, he told us that the, that the diaries at some point were um, found in an attic and um, most of them disposed with, uh, without further thought. Uh, this sounds as abhorrent as it, uh, as it may sound. This is uh, um, unfortunately not, uh, probably not simply guesswork. I think that uh, that was certainly possible. Um, it's hard to imagine it, but um, that was his explanation for it. So let's just summarize. We have about, um, we have about 30% of what she wrote and of that 30%, maybe two thirds has been published. So half again as much needs to be uh, put into into print. In other right. words, even though we have just a small amount left over, there's still plenty, plenty uh, for us to uh, to look at and to publish and to get acquainted with. And for all of the uh, fears that Mahler's friends had, uh, we haven't find found anything too compromising in all of this material. Uh, and it's been, of course, it's uh, our duty to um, Mahler studies and to the Mahler community to have this uh, published. Now. There is one final main source for what has survived. And uh, why don't you tell us about that, Stephen? One final main source? Henri-Louis de Lagrange managed to purchase um, these diaries. Oh, yes, uh, yes. The ones that were left over. Yes, he did. And uh, he very kindly allowed me to photograph them. Uh, he just gave me the keys to the apartment and said, go. <laughs> And there was compiled by Killian a much longer typescript than what he ultimately published. And that has quite a bit of information that isn't widely known as well. So as you know, you and I are wading through all of this and we're going to finish it, aren't we, Morton? Yeah, we are going to finish this. <laughs> 
And uh, it, this is a little bit of an announcement to the Mali community that this will be published. We are determined to publish this in German and in English. Uh, and uh, we're not at the point where we can approach publishers, but uh, there is a lot of valuable material here. You and I have uh, published already the segments on Brahms, that ended up being quite a bit of material that we've already published in a fest trip for De Lagrange. Um, but we also, uh, there's lots more. And I, I asked you to uh, bring, bring along some, uh, some uh, maybe this was, I think a quote about Bruckner. Uh, maybe we can we can read that. This is unpublished from Natalie's uh, recollections. Yes, there are a couple of interesting passages on Bruckner there. Uh, I don't have a printer, so I've got to fish this up on email. Okay. Maybe we can have a look at the diaries while we're waiting here. Yes. Um, you can post it. Maybe you can post those pages that we've. Uh, that we've uh, created. So this is this is an example of a of one of the the journals that has been bound, uh, and it's numbered the Maleriana Roman II. Uh, this is a clean, copied page, um, and we go to the next one. So this is a copyist, and here we have uh, a clean page that's now started the process of Natalie's uh, editing. Um, so you get some impression of the work that goes into this. Um, and as, I, as we've said, a lot of this has been, no, we'll wait, for, we'll wait for, the, for the next quote here. Okay, so this gives you all a sense of what this looks like. Um, it's all in, uh, in fairly legible hand. I know that may not look legible, but it, it is. <laughs> Mahler's hand is notoriously much worse than that. Um, but, um, Stephen, maybe you can, uh, maybe you have that quote about Bruckner already. Yes, can we have the picture of the Bruckner monument? Right, we'll go to that next. There we go. So um, she's talking with Mahler about Bruckner and she says, I told Gustav today as I stood in the city park before the Bruckner monument, uh, which so recently annoyed you, two little boys behind me were also looking on uh, and one presented his opinion in very appropriate words. He said, the man's too small for the situation, which aptly characterizes the disproportionateness in the composition, because the gigantic female figure who extends as genius, extends the laurel branch to Bruckner. You, it's a little hard in that photograph to see in her right hand, but that's supposed to be a laurel branch, okay. Um, almost occupies the entire monument in comparison to which Bruckner's small bust almost vanishes. And he himself uh, is represented there as almost malnourished, which is today so such a popular image, uh, instead of in the power of his manhood. On January 28th, in the previous Philharmonic concert that I got to hear under Gustav's direction before my departure, he performed the Romantic Symphony by Bruckner, that's the fourth, Mendelssohn's Calm Sea and Prosperous Voyage, and the Wagner Kaiser March. In the days uh, of the preceding rehearsals, Gustav once said to me, if it were up to my innermost opinion, I would hardly perform Bruckner in the Philharmonic concerts, uh, which are so tightly limited that only the best can go there. One really cannot expect the public to listen to these uh, musical patterns and terrible absurdities, albeit that they are often interrupted by heavenly inspirations and themes. Concerning Mendelssohn's Calm Sea, Gustav said, Mendelssohn is above all a splendid colorist. No one ever surpassed him in orchestral technique. If he had written nothing other than this overture, the Hebrides, and his second symphony, he would already be among the greatest composers of all time. And then he adds, my only happy times are the rehearsals for the Philharmonic concerts. The entire opera is a shameful prostitution. And another time, the opera is a blast furnace that continually devours the best material in great quantity. There you go. I uh, quite sounding out in quite a negative way about Bruckner. I mean, many people cite Bruckner as his teacher and mentor, but that clearly was not the case. 
Um, uh, these these negative um, reviews, these negative opinions of, of Bruckner have been withheld. Alma withheld them, certainly, in her edition of the letters. Um, but um, here, Natalie goes right into it and, uh, and makes it quite clear what uh, Mahler's perspective was. By the way, Natalie and Mahler were not alone in their opinion of this uh, statue. If we look at the statue today, um, we will see that, in fact, the uh, that genius has been removed and that... Um, Bruckner uh, is not disproportionate uh, as he was before. <laughs> if we can go to the next uh, slide, I think we're going to see um, another quote, um, it, and you'll see there to the bottom on the on the on the left, you'll see that Natalie has crossed this out, and she's written across the top of this little segment, "Vec." Get so, it out of here. Get it out of here. Get it away. Uh, remove. And this is another passage on, on Bruckner. Do you have that uh, passage as well, Stephen? Yes. And even though she said, in fact, naturally, we're not going to throw it away. <laughs> the Bruckner fifth, wherein Gustav made large cuts in the first movement, and that, by the way, is true, made large cuts in the first movement to eliminate vacuity and incoherence, aroused in Gustav more sorrow than joy as he marveled at its splendid, significant, even magnificently Beethovenian themes and passages. Quote, because nothing is firmly established, further developed, and melted into a whole. Superficially and awkwardly, he puts one thing after another, like cabbage and turnips, without even making the attempt at an outline of a logical structure. It is as though he adds to his weaving, now this scrap of thread, now that one, which he picks up God only knows where, which doesn't belong to it and destroys the unity and beauty of the whole, as though he would patch it up without discretion and would bind it with crude knots. Gustav found the most unified and best to be the scherzo and trio with its distinctive, wonderful, genuinely Viennese melody. But you'll see, cried Gustav, without the scalpel, Bruckner cannot be helped. He will nowhere gain entry, never become established in the concert repertoire as he is. I've done what I could to bring him to life, and perhaps such that the three symphonies that I've hitherto presented in the Philharmonic concerts with dramaturgical cuts will be the first to be performed in future. Concerning the extremely stormy applause-ridden reception of the symphony, he said, yeah, now after his death, since during his lifetime, they did not perform and did not listen to him, but only humiliated and hissed him. Gustav was very indignant. Uh, it's an extraordinary passage. I mean, he both defends Bruckner's memory because of course he knew, knew Bruckner, uh, and disparages his inability from, from Mahler's perspective to develop coherently uh, the, the development and the, and, the, and the sort of trajectory of the symphonic language. Um, well, as regards the future, he sure got that one wrong. He sure got that one wrong, yes. Yeah. He felt that perhaps Bruckner being a recent contemporary was being played out of, uh, out of living memory as opposed to something of a permanent contribution to the repertoire. Uh, absolutely fascinating. And I think there be plenty more passages like that uh, when we get around to publishing this, uh, this new book. Which we are going to do, aren't we? Yeah, <laughs> which we're going to do. <laughs> this is a multi-year project, as you can all imagine, uh, but it is definitely uh, very, very worthwhile. And, and we're having, um, Finding things like this, of course, are really are a, a contribution to the Mala literature that needs to be needs to be released. Well, uh, before we close this topic, we should mention also a letter that you and I published a few years ago um, yes. that uh, Natalie prepared with um, basically with materials that she knew she wasn't going to be putting into the book, that she had no intention of releasing to the wider public, but that she felt she owed a uh, posterity, a debt to at least somehow write this down. And she wrote to her assistant, Hans Riel, about Mahler's love life. There's no other way to put it. Um, we I think we it. have a page of the, the first page of it, don't we? 
I don't think we've put that on the slides. This oh, okay. is a um, th this is a, a letter that she wrote basically to her assistant to say, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to do with this information. I have the information. I know this is not something that people will necessarily want to publish, but I do feel I need to, to notate it. Um, so this publication in the Musical Quarterly that came out a number of years ago is available for everyone now to see. Uh, maybe we want to just summarize briefly what Natalie's information was on his love life and whether this has any impact on the historical record. Well, she was apparently, I mean, he was apparently willing to discuss with her uh, in some detail what went on during nine of his various affairs, um, several of them with singers in the operas where he conducted. And um, the most extensive one and most interesting one really is the affair with Marianne von Faber, uh, which took place in Leipzig at the time of the completion of the Drei Pintos. And she claims that it was Marian who persuaded him that he should resume his own composing, um, which he did, finished the first symphony. And he dedicated the, the now removed Blumina movement to, to Marian as well. Yes. yes. Um, that was, uh, um, that was a failed relationship and that she was married and that uh, he wanted to, uh, to run away with her quite literally and, uh, and uh, she didn't show up. What um, else is in there of course is Natalie's um, uh, discussions of Justina and, yes. and uh, the relationship that Mahler had. She was sort of the um, um, I don't know, the, the lion at uh, the front of the lair trying to, you know, keep away anything un unpleasant, any, any female uh, presence that she was not uh, approving of. Uh, it says a lot about their relationship too, right? The brother and yes. sister. Now, she... of course, you can read some underlying jealousy into all that because Natalie would have loved to marry Muller, but um, he wasn't about to do it. No, Mahler made that clear too in his letters to Justina that are quite apart from, from uh, Natalie's recollections. But there does seem to have been um, a type of love affair with them, at least at two points in their relationship, one at the very beginning and one at the very end of their relationship. Uh, Mahler was uh, single and, uh, and he had not yet uh, met Alma. How reliable are these, these, uh, these accounts of these, these, I would say, one night trysts that she talks about? Well, I think it was a little bit longer than that, maybe as long as a week or 10 days. But um, again, we've heard Sibylla say that she finds Natalie to be quite an accurate, reliable source. And I would say the same thing. Uh, after all, it's not as though Natalie is going out and uh, putting this in newspaper articles and that sort of thing. It, it was a private letter to someone who was assisting her um, for the future, if and when needed. <clears throat> in this letter, she writes a very moving, it's a very moving passage. She says, I'm, I'm leaving this to posterity for, the, for, for future generations to decide what to do with this information. Right. And if anything, it, it really, to my mind, uh, it cements Natalie's contribution to the biography and her incredible self-awareness and sense of duty uh, to everything that she could notate about Mahler and his life. Uh, and the end of that letter is very touching when she realizes she will never be a part of Mahler's life again. Um, but she is still grateful for having had that experience. It's odd because at the, at the same time as they're sort of breaking up, as, as Mahler writes to Justina uh, as we go into the fall of, uh, of 1901, um, he, he's, he's about to meet Alma, of course, he doesn't know this, but he writes a letter to Justina saying, you know, she's just, she just doesn't get it. Uh, she just doesn't understand that I'll never be able to, to love her. I'll never be able to be that partner that she so desires. Mm. The paradox here, of course, is her devotion, her dedication has been far more important in terms of the historical record, in terms of what we can rely on about Mahler than his ultimate marriage to Alma, who was a very different personality. And though he was very much in love with her, um, we don't know if he shared these kinds of thoughts, perhaps he did, but she, she certainly never went 
to the lengths that Natalie did to notate them. Well, it's a, <clears throat> a fascinating story and, and, uh, and uh, one that will go on, I'm sure, uh, and, and we'll certainly find uh, more expression in this forthcoming publication, Stephen. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thanks for your many thoughts on this fascinating figure. Thank you. Well, thank you. Just a reminder, if you are with us uh, live, uh, feel free to send us questions to the chat. We will be happy to answer at the end of the hour. The relationship between Gustav and Natalie is at the heart of a film written and directed by our next guest, Beata Talberg. I want to welcome Beata. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure having you on the show, Beata, and uh, our audience will soon find out uh, why your contribution is so important to this Mahler Hour. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You haven't been on the show yet, and people may not know you. Yeah. Well, I'm a filmmaker <laughs> based in Vienna. Um, I often do films about uh, historical subjects, historical personalities, because I'm interested in their decisions. And you see in the consequences of their decisions, uh, you can see a life, uh, was it wrong or right, let's say, let's put it that way. And uh, yeah, and um, my films are always, let's say, a little different. They are in a way documentaries, uh, as they follow real persons, real situations. But I always put in, uh, well, never say reenactments, because I don't like this word. Uh, I call it in German, I say Spielszenen. So um, actors and actresses uh, play, but it's not like that, that you hear what they are doing. This is reenactment, you know? So this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And you've done a huge range of films and projects covering literary figures and, and, uh, and historical figures and musical figures uh, for a very, very long time. Um, a number of years ago, you decided to make My Time Will Come. Gustav Mahler is remembered by Natalie Bauerlechner. Uh, we see some scenes here from the production and uh, the artwork for the, uh, for the film. What inspired you to tackle this particular subject? Well, Natalie herself. Um, it, uh, Natalie uh, came up in the, in the books, of course, I begin always with reading meters of books and uh, the most important uh, or interesting quotes by Mahler had the words after uh, as uh, his friend Natalie Bauerlechner wrote or said mm -hmm. and I thought okay friend sex what kind <laughs> of friend <laughs> yeah, that was immediately, I'm sorry, it is like that. And, uh, and then I went around and, and of course I met uh, scientists and, and uh, asked the people of the Mahler Society in Vienna. And, but back then she was a footnote, literally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was always like, they said, yeah, yeah, Natalie, yeah, she's a kind of a groupie and all that. And, I didn't believe, believe it. I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. So what kind of person was, was, was Bauer Leichner? Well, we heard it uh, very uh, wonderfully described earlier. Uh, let me just add, uh, to me, she lived to a certain extent, we always have to say to a certain extent, uh, a free and self-determined life as a woman. Because when you think of that time, you, you as a woman, you couldn't rent a flat. You couldn't uh, decide by yourself whom you want to marry. Um, you couldn't, if your husband died, you, you lost your children because there was a legal guardian for, for the children. Um, and all these things. And, and uh, as a musician, as she had something in her life and elixir let's say yeah if you are a musician or if you are a filmmaker or if you are a, if you write books you have your elixir 
And I think that was uh, something both had in common. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, let's have a look from an early segment of the film where you really state your thesis at the very, very beginning. Uh, uh, Marco, can we have that? Gustav Mahler. It's through the prism of his wife Alma's lens that we see his life. Yet Alma was often economical with the truth. There's a more detailed portrait of Gustav Mahler. Finely sketched, it's embedded in my memory. I was the woman by his side. So that's just a very beautiful rendering of the materials that you found in Paris, right? I mean, this is, uh, yeah. this is, I think it's an inter it's a fascinating combination of, uh, of, uh, of ways of combining the past and the present and, and, and history. And so, as I've said, you know, what you produce is sort of a mix of documentary and drama, reenactment and artistic license. Uh, so, you, you know, I remember you, you were interviewing all these people, you visited Henri-Louis de Lagrange, you looked at the, at the uh, unpublished uh, memoirs, etc. Um, so, and we hear Natalie speaking, you hear her speaking just now, you hear her throughout the film speaking, it's her narrative, so to speak. Wh whose words are we hearing and, and what are you, what, what's this mix supposed to try to uh, uh, achieve? Yes, um, first of all, we have to think of, I made this film 10 years ago. Yeah, if it still works, fine. But it was 10 years ago. And um, Natalie Bauer-Lechner even didn't have a Wikipedia mention. So there was not much about Natalie Bauer-Lechner. And there were two guys I met during the research that were open. And that was uh, Monsieur de la Grange. He said, yes, that's a good subject, do that. And uh, nobody puts light on Natalie. And actually it was you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I went to, to Paris and, and had the chance to, to read this. And as you mentioned, it's readable, although it's uh, written in an old style. Um, but then it's written language. And what you do in films is spoken language. So I had to find a kind of a new language uh, that doesn't um, say anything wrong. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't uh, verfälsch, was is, was is verfälsch? Falsify. Yeah. The, the words by Natalie. So, uh, and I really put a lot of um, uh, work on that because I wanted to make it in a good way. So I, everything she says in, in the film or describes or uh, places, uh, words by Gustav Mahler are always original. And I never changed that. And, and all these, things are true, there's nothing I put in, but I changed uh, uh, the sentences to spoken language. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixture, but it's not uh, out of my fantasy. Right, well, there are moments, I mean, where, you know, I, f I feel you drawing from different sources and wondering how they quite they overlap. And there is perspectivism in this. There is a certain- Of course, in every film. <laughs> sub-narrative that you're pushing as well. And one of, one of the most, of course, um, fascinating is the relationship between these two exceptionally creative people. Uh, because this is, of course, what's 
this is the dynamic you're describing his career. It's a wonderful sort of walk through his career, but at the heart of it is this relationship. And Natalie comes across as sort of both adoring and frustrated at the same time. Let's have, let's have a look at this, uh, the second segment of the film here. Recanted the next day. Reaping financial rewards no longer seemed realistic to him. One day, he felt ready to embrace the entire world. The next, he sank to the depths of depression. Of all the creative spirits, the composer is the most wretched. His kingdom is not of this world, and very often he simply lacks the time to be a human being. And then this sentence that I was to hear time and again. If only I could but once hear my music and learn from it, otherwise it will always remain dull theory. Nature reconciled him with his fate. Amidst its constant growth and renewal, he usually became as calm and meek as a child. I had not planned to do so, but it had to be. And eventually, I asked him the question of all questions. How do you approach your compositions? Do you start with words or sounds? At first, he teased me. Do you know how a trumpet is made? You take a hole and wrap a sheet of metal around it. But then, he proceeded to explain his methods more seriously. I kept asking him for details and evidence for his statements. He discovered that I jotted down everything he said about his music, about the books we read, his masters, even the blades of grass. I had become his little squid, always ready to squirt ink for posterity's sake. Uh, it's just it's just beautiful, Beata. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I, I saw uh, just uh, pictures, a picture after picture, not uh, rolling, oh. moving. I'm sorry if somebody else uh, saw it like that. It's a it's a film. It's not a frozen picture after a frozen picture. No, you may have a, a weak internet connection because I saw it as a beautiful flowing film with. Uh, okay. Okay. Cinematography. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is uh, this is a um, a wonderful scene that you've created, and it's created, as you said, it's a sort of a, a a compilation of many different scenes from her her recollections. It's uh, putting together it all in this very concentrated form. Um, what Mahler did with this adoration. Th that was probably the most difficult thing for him. Not, not, not her intelligence and, or, or her looks or whatever it was that he was also dealing with this, but this adoration, that seemed to be something that bothered him. In fact, you mentioned this a little bit in the, mm -hmm, in the film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So here it, it, it verges on the romantic. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of, you're dancing around this topic and, and the, nature, the nature of this, of this dynamic. And as you said, this, was, this film was done over 10 years ago. And um, you sort of suggest that they were lovers. And of course, no one knew that they were lovers. This, this letter that, that she writes to Hans Riel wasn't uh, uh, auctioned off until uh, many years later. Um, there are indications in the recollections that are not published that this may and may not have happened. So my question is, you know, can intuition, which is really partly also what you're operating on here, anticipate historical fact? <laughs> you seem to have done yes. that. 
Yes, to me, to me, yes. Uh, you know, of course, it was the question of the questions. For me, when I when I, I worked on Natalie and Marla in their relationship, of course, this question comes up. And I asked so many people and uh, they said, no, certainly not. And uh, and then I was, uh, I read this uh, part of their life when they were in Bechtes Garden. Yes. And, uh, the pest was going around, the death, uh, the black death. So, and, and it was such a strong moment. Uh, Marla had to go back to Hamburg um, and he dictated her his last will. And they talked everything over, what should happen to the siblings and so on. And I think when you do that, this is such an, intimate and 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 uh, existentialistic moment in his life and also in her life she couldn't know if if he will come back or not if she will see him again yeah that was yeah. really a tough time we can we can only imagine now better uh, as we have corona and 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 uh, a war in the world yeah so but um I'm an empathic person and I have to be as a filmmaker. And um, when I read those things, uh, pictures come into my mind. I see it in three dimensions. And uh, I was sure uh, there in Berchtesgaden it happened because I thought um, I would do it now. I would go to bed with him now. <laughs> Well, you were right about it. I had the privilege of telling you, of inviting you for coffee. I'll never forget. I said, I'm glad you're sitting down because it turns out you were right. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful film. And, uh, and of course, your work on the historical side of it, but also your intuitive side uh, have really lent it uh, all of the, um, let's put it this way, it stands up well. And even <laughs> though a few historical facts may have changed over time, uh, it's certainly worth, uh, worth watching, so. Um, thank you very much for sharing you. the film with us today, Beata. Thank you. <laughs> if this foray into the life of Natalie Bauer-Lechner and her importance to Gustav Mahler has piqued your interest, you are in luck. This summer, the Gustav Mahler Festival in Steinbach and Mattesee is entirely devoted to this crucial figure. From July 6th to July 10th, 2022, we will have a lecture, an outdoor walk in the stunningly beautiful natural setting, an evening of chamber music by women composers of Natalie's time, a recital by the famed mezzo Iris Vermillion, and Beata Talbeck's film, with Beata present to speak about this film. It will take place at or near the inn where Mahler stayed in the summers of 1893 to 1896, where he finished the second and third symphonies, and you can visit the composing hut where he wrote it all. You can find all the details uh, about the festival on the Mahler minus steinbach.at website. All right, let's take some questions for our presenters. And I already have a number of them here. Um, let's see if I can pull some of this up here. I have a question for, um, by, from Steve Sarper. Um, is Beata Talberg's film available on any of the streaming services, Netflix, Amazon, Etc. So we'll need you back, Beata. Yes, here I am. <laughs> well, uh, it's distributed by Unitel, uh, and Unitel made a DVD back then. And um, I don't know if it's somewhere on Netflix or even we have in Austria a little uh, streamer, Flimit. They have sometimes films like that. I have to check it out actually uh, to answer this question, but there is a, a DVD and if somebody is really interested, just wrote to Unitel in, in Munich uh, and they will help you, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question, was Natalie's focus on, this is from Anthony Raumann, it, was Natalie's focus on Mala due to her hope that she would eventually marry and if not remain part of his life? 
any inclinations in her letters? Was she hoping for this? Or maybe about to have you fantasized about them really getting married? What would that have looked like? What would that mean to history? <laughs> I think, I think uh, that changed. Uh, that changes in relationships. Think of all your relationships. Sometimes you think, oh, yes, I will marry him. <laughs> Next time you think, oh, better not. <laughs> There's no cause to, to get separated, but no, I, I, I don't marry him now. And then the years pass. But uh, I think it was the same with her. It, it was a relationship. And then it's uh, in relationships, you, you also argue or you have bad times and they had bad times. And yeah. you mentioned uh, his... Um, uh, that he was uh, not so amused about her adoration. So, and, uh, and of course that's bad for, for a relationship uh, in general, if somebody is too, ador uh, too much adoring. So uh, I think there were times when she really wanted and intended to, to spend her life with him, but I guess she was, the she was also an intelligent woman. She, and an empathic woman. So she knew from a certain moment on that he will not marry her. And, um, and I guess she was not a victim. She decided to, to go on with him um, and not being married with him. Mm -hmm. uh and this is another question from Fantadel Rahman, which actually follows up exactly to what you're saying. Why would an independent-minded woman succumb to a man who had several affairs? I mean, she knew about his, his relationship. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes this was a man who asked this question, I'm sure. Yes, you are correct. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, you know, um, um, as a woman, this is such a romantic imagination about relationships of women. We have relationships like you. We know that he's married. We know that we want to spend just one night with him or two. And, and you know, don't be too romantic about us women. Well, I, if you read Natalie's Fragmente, you'll see that uh, I wouldn't call it free love, but her idea of love is really completely outside of any institutional definition. Yes, and she had in her later life, I guess she had, if I remember it well and right, uh, she had a younger lover uh, even. And, and she lived herself, as I said, she lived a quite uh, free life so, so, and was open-minded. And yeah. uh, <laughs> so it worked, <laughs> the both of them. I have a question from Louis Eckstein who asks, is the film also in German? Yes, it is. Of course, that was the first version in German. And uh, I want to mention that uh, the two actors you see are uh, Petra Morse. She's a very acclaimed actress in, in uh, Austria and the German speaking countries. Uh, she, uh, was a long member of the Burgtheater. And the other one is uh, Robert Ritter. Um, and I think they did it very bravely. Yes, no, the, the very, very enjoyable performances. Um, I have a question from Ian Ross. Uh, does Beata think that Mahler treated Natalie heartlessly when he met Alma or was the break inevitable? Or oh, was the, the last thing I didn't understand? Was okay. the break inevitable? In other words, was it already clear that there wouldn't be a relationship? Oh, I guess, yeah. I guess the break was a hard thing to her in the end. And I put this in the, in the film like that. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, of course, it uh, went better sometimes, sometimes worse. But there was not the question uh, that... Uh, he didn't want to see her anymore or spend time with her anymore. And, um, and of course, uh, Alma was younger, much younger than her. This is, uh, this is a human reaction. Every man and every woman 
would react like this if you are uh, together for so many years and and you share so much and you you spend let's say an intimate life and then one of you both says no i found another we can't see anymore this is a hard moment and and if it was heartless by 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 Marla, well he had to decide if if he if he marries another woman maybe he couldn't be together with uh, natalie anymore well i mean he Mahler was not romantically involved with natalie these 10 years there was some at the yeah, very beginning of course, at the very, and at the very end and in 1901 the summer of 1901 which is the, the sort of the last twist that, that natalie describes between them that just a few weeks later a few maybe a month later Mahler is writing to his family to justina to his sister and 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 trying to somehow get the message across to Natalie that this this don't get your hopes up this was a this was an isolated incident this is not something i see long term and mm -hmm. and to his credit he does this before he meets alma this was not something that he he's trying to ride out and then turn into something and then he meets someone else that's not what happened uh, mm -hmm. and, and as we know he met alma at the soiree just a, just a few weeks after mm -hmm. that so in addition to the fact that he was now with Alma, he uh, had an, a, a wife to be who was doing everything she could to uh, distance Mahler from many of his earlier friends, including Natalie, but also Lippiner and many other other friends that had been in that crowd with Natalie were now uh, uh, marginalized by Alma. This was a very clear uh, move on her part. Um, I have another question that just came in and I think that's gonna have to be it because we're way over time again. Uh, so I have a question from uh, Chauncey Wigglesworth. Do you think that if Mahler had arrived uh, or sorry, married someone else, Natalie would not have cut ties so completely? Um, uh, was it Mahler's choice or Alma's that caused Natalie to make that total break? Well, I think I <laughs> unknowingly went into that a little bit myself here. No, it was clearly Alma and it wasn't just Natalie that was involved in being distanced here. Uh, if we had Stephen and and uh, and Sibylla, uh, we would also be able to discuss this. But I I'm afraid we're really reaching the end of our time here. And uh, I would like to thank um, thank you for for taking the questions, um, Beata. But we do have to go on. Um, I just wanted to continue a little bit in the spirit of what I announced. For those of you wishing to round out your Mahler summer of 2022, you should know that there are Mahler festivals at all three of the composing huts he had built in his lifetime this summer. So from July 1 to July 3, the Mahler Forum will be exploring creativity and spaces of artistic retreat with presentations and performances, including a world premiere. That's in Mayanik uh, and Klagenfurt, where Mahler also had a hut built uh, you can see that in one of the photos here. That's from July 1 to July 3. As just announced, the Steinbach Festival will celebrate Natalie Bauer Lechner from July 6 to July 10 uh, in Steinbach. And you have the uh, URL there too. And the Gustav Mahler Weeks return to Toblach, where Mahler's Titan and Das Lied von der Erde, uh, numerous additional concerts, as well as a conference on Mahler's influence on composers of the 20th century will take place from July 9 through 21, that's in Toblach in, um, in Northern Italy. That's uh, pretty much the show today. I'm sorry we're running over. The Mahler Hour is brought to you by Mahler Foundation and contributors around the world. It is a monthly streaming event bringing together individuals interested in the composer, the thinker, the humanist, Gustav Mahler, as we explored not only his life and works, but also how his legacy still informs essential aspects of the human experience and how we can turn that experience into a force for the good in today's world. Become a member and support our activities. I want to thank our guests, Sibylle Werner, Stephen Heffling, Beata Talberg, as well as our fabulous production team, Marco Ayala, our production team, our community manager and technical support today, and Monica Angiano, our executive director for administration. As a reminder, uh, and as an announcement, the next edition of the Mahler Hour will be airing live April 23rd on YouTube with a special program dedicated to Ukraine. I will be speaking with the conductor and founder of the Youth Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine, Oksana Linev. Please join us for this very special Mahler Hour on April 23rd from Ukraine. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.